As far as laptops go, this one here might be the least laptopiest. It's the Dell XPS M2010 released back in 2006. It's a huge 20 inch laptop. That was kindly given to me by Callum over at Australian Computer Traders. They sell ex-government and refurbished computers. I've used them for years and go check them out. I've left the link in the description. This is huge. There's literally just one laptop in this box. It's a huge box. I wanna go see what's in it. So let's get started. While the box is huge, the laptop is also definitely a chonker. This has been sitting around for a week or so and I'm simply dying to open it up. At the end of this video, I'll also be opening some fan mail as well, so stay tuned for that. Wow, they did not skimp on bubble wrap, that's for sure. And here is the laptop itself. Easily the heaviest one I've ever held. Now, this is how you should send a laptop to make sure it arrives safely. Although I've been told that this is in pretty poor condition, but it does turn on at the very least. Oh, and this model even has a carry handle. That's sadly the rubberized coating, especially on the top surface, has started to become sticky. And at the time, Dell described this huge slab of tech as the showstopper, allowing you to experience the joy of entertainment. And yes, I'll agree that this style is definitely one of a kind. And there we have it, the absolutely huge laptop with an impressive 20 inch display. I can't wait to give it a good cleaning, which it desperately needs. What a truly wonderfully different design with an almost desktop looking keyboard, which is detachable, something you do not see with most laptops. Having the optical drive in the center is very uncommon, but looks incredibly futuristic. Since it's made to be a multimedia powerhouse, it's got plenty of speakers and plenty of thickness with a great deal of motion from the hinge, allowing you to angle it closer towards the keyboard. So let's try powering it up and see exactly what this gargantuan device can do. Once powered on, it appears to function, however, there doesn't seem to be any response to keyboard inputs. The wireless keyboard appears to be powered by the laptop. I press the pairing button on the back of the keyboard, which appears to be holding a charge as well. It is now flashing as it waits to be paired to the laptop itself. And following an online guide, I got both the laptop and keyboard into pairing mode, however, it didn't seem to do anything. Apparently an operating system does have to be installed for this to work, and thankfully the mechanism to raise the disk drive does work. Let's take a look underneath. Sadly, this coating has also started to melt a little bit. I'm struggling to think of any good reasons why you'd want the base of your device covered in rubber. Simply touching it does leave your hands a little bit sticky. Now time to take it apart. And this huge battery also appears to be holding a charge. Even though it's massive, I doubt it would have lasted long even when it was new. Let's see what's inside. Under this little panel, we've got access to the RAM, Wi-Fi module, and CMOS battery. Surprisingly, there's only one gigabyte in here, and I'll definitely be adding some more later in the video. I will also be installing Windows Vista for the most authentic experience possible. Here's the fairly decent subwoofer that'll contribute greatly to that multimedia experience. It seems as if you've got to access the other components from the top. The left cover appears to be somewhat broken. However, the right side's mechanism, which is released by pushing the button at the rear, isn't damaged at all. Next, I removed several Phillips head screws, all of which had a little indicator implying that they needed to be removed to get in further. Be careful when removing the optical drive and top casing as two connectors will still be attached to the motherboard. And there we have it, the surprisingly clean and spacious interior of the XPS M2010. Given how complex the optical drive raising mechanism is, I'm surprised it hasn't broken over the years. But then again, the internals suggest it was barely used at all perhaps. And here's the dedicated fan for the socketed CPU. And on the other side, we've got an equally as well cooled graphics card, most likely a 256 megabyte Radeon X1800. A CNET article mentioned this laptop being sold with the option for dual hard disks in RAID 0 for increased drive performance. I'll simply be putting in an inexpensive solid state drive. If I'd really planned ahead, I could have also put in a faster CPU. In here is a two gigahertz T7200. The graphics card is also technically upgraded However, I'm not aware of any other cards made to fit in this laptop specifically. For a device that's almost 18 years old, there's a severe lack of dust. And since this device is lacking an SSD and a good amount of RAM, I figured I'd simply pull it from another device I covered recently, the ASUS Lamborghini laptop. Although when I pulled it out, I forgot I'd removed the battery and it kind of fell on the floor. It fell onto carpet, but the weight of the cells clearly caused a bit of damage. It looks largely intact, so I temporarily taped it back together. I put four gigabytes of DDR2 in here, which will be a nice improvement for the 
XPS M2010. I'm also using this SSD as I know it will work with hardware from this time period. As I learned during previous videos, not all SATA 3 SSDs will work on an old SATA 1 interface. Now, time to remove the very hard crusty thermal paste. I thought I'd also try some supposedly anti-static brushes when I'm dusting off electronics. Once our house is built, I'll likely invest in a little vacuum station, and it's also not too long until the house is done. After a bit of fiddling, the heatsink finally came off. The paste on here was unsurprisingly very crusty, but some patients combined with isopropyl alcohol eventually got it all off. I'd imagine that thermal compound this mummified wouldn't transfer heat well at all. I will however be leaving the small thermal pads used for the memory chips as they still seem quite malleable. While the T7200 chip isn't the fastest one you could put in here, it is thankfully 64-bit, meaning modern operating systems should be pretty easy to run on here. Even though the fans aren't very dusty, I took them outside and brushed them out. I guess there's every chance someone cleaned this laptop out at some point, and if you haven't cleaned your laptop fans out in a few years, there's no better time than now. I also bought some new tubes of Arctic MX4 thermal paste. It's a great all-round paste that seems to last quite a while. Also, thanks to whoever the person was that sent me a massive tube of MX4 many years ago. It really lasted me a long time. The cheapest price I could find was $5 Australian for a 4 gram tube from PCK Skier, which ended up being cheaper per gram than buying the larger 45 gram tube from anywhere else. This is honestly a seriously cool form factor of laptop. I wish Dell supported it for a few more years, although I'm guessing for most people this was far too impractical, but I'm sure a laptop with a 20 inch display could be made in a much smaller form factor with modern hardware, and the M2010 does appear to still be functional thankfully. Some of the clips that hold this cover on are simply missing, however I should be able to glue a few of the damaged ones back in place. I left it to harden overnight and the clips look a lot stronger now. It took me far too long to realise that the screwdriver I was using was far too wide to insert correctly, so the mechanism wasn't being pushed in far enough. The side with the damaged clips does seem to sit properly now after my super glue repair. And now for my favourite part of any video, the cleaning, starting off with a dusting. The keyboard wasn't too grimy, but I always give them a wipe off with some eucalyptus oil to remove any gunk and bacteria. It was also very effective at removing what looked to be old sticker residue. I wish I knew where this device originally came from, as I have no idea why a school or potentially a government department would even purchase something like this. Dark plastics like this are absolute fingerprint magnets. The glossy display is pretty much the same, very easy to get dirty. However, it's in almost pristine condition after a wipe with some lens cleaner. But the real challenge is dealing with the degrading sticky rubber on the outer coating. I tried some mineral turpentine with a rag, which did remove some of the rubber, but the surface was still sticky to the touch. Isopropyl alcohol is also supposed to be very effective, however it didn't reduce the stickiness. It seemed as if Ajax spray and wipe was best at removing the rubber itself, which seemed to be the best way to go. Sadly, this can be quite time consuming removing all the rubber, especially since this is one of the largest laptops ever made. I eventually resorted to scraping the surface off with a soft plastic tool. This shouldn't scratch the surface surface underneath, but it will take me quite a while. It seems that rubberized surfaces don't stand the test of time, and it blows my mind to think that this is nearly 20 years old. It comes down to brute force and a lot of patience it seems. It's fair to say that my arm was now very tired. Thankfully the underside isn't currently as bad as this. Most companies stopped using this kind of textured surface in recent years, and after a lot of rubbing and a fair amount of scrubbing, all of the rubber was gone from the top casing. The surface is now smooth to the touch and thankfully no longer sticky. With more polishing it may even look a little bit better, however this is a big improvement, and quite honestly I think I'm going to go insane if I have to remove any more rubber. The Dell is detecting the SSD and attempts to load into Windows, however it blue screens. So a fresh copy of Windows Vista is in order, and making your own Windows Vista USB installer is very easy. Watch my ASUS Lamborghini laptop video to find out how. In the BIOS I set the USB drive as the first boot option. First step done, it loaded into the booter successfully. With the SSD formatted, all the files then copied over. After about 30 minutes we had Windows Vista up and running. I realise I forgot to install the 4GB of RAM, but apart from that and some missing drivers, the system seemed fine. 
Pretty much all the necessary drivers can be found on Dell's website, which is great to see for such an old device. Even the webcam is functional. Being able to adjust the tilt is a feature you don't see on laptops anymore. And the quality is also pretty excellent for an 18 year old device. With the drivers sorted, let's put in the RAM. Four gigabytes would have been insane back in 2006 and 2007. Having easy access to the CMOS battery under this cover will definitely come in handy when it finally dies. In a few years time, I may have to remove the rubber on the base of the laptop as well. It thankfully isn't as bad as the top, it's just a little bit dirty. But honestly, why have a rubberized base? I simply don't get it. I read somewhere online that simply removing the keyboard's battery and putting it back in will make it connect. And what do you know, it seemed to be responding to inputs once I turned the laptop back on. With my fingers crossed, it actually works now. The 4GB of RAM is also working and detected. It's truly a weird feeling using what looks to be a desktop keyboard with a laptop. Being able to detach it is also a real game changer and I don't know of any other laptops that do this. For such a huge device, it's quite elegant and thankfully the screen hinge has survived. It also feels as if the display is floating, a lot like the screen with Apple's iMac G4. Drive goes up, drive goes down. Drive goes up, drive goes down. Time to play a game on the big screen. I love that you can see the disc as it spins up. Star Wars Battlefront 2 runs pretty well. The HEI Radeon X1800 features 256 megabytes of GDDR3 memory and should handle all games pre-2006 with ease. Another classic I always like to test out is old school RuneScape. It's wonderful that the client will run on ancient versions of Windows. And I'll use any excuse to put discs in here. It's simply so much fun. Just like Grand Theft Auto 3, which runs great on this system. You can even see me in the highly glossy reflection. If you want to take an ancient version of Windows Online, which I'd strongly recommend not doing, you could use the Supermium browser. It even runs YouTube pretty well, which is impressive on such old hardware. This truly is a laptop like no other. To have a screen this good and big is definitely not common. The typing experience is phenomenal as it basically has a full-size desktop keyboard. The trackpad does work, but I'd strongly recommend an external mouse. The features are rich and so is the port selection. In addition to Wi-Fi, you've got a modem, ethernet, display output, lots of USB ports and some audio jacks. Thankfully, it does have that handle because in terms of portability, it's honestly like carrying a bag full of bricks. And using it as an actual laptop is possible, but I'd say it's definitely not recommended. So it's time to open up some mail that you've sent to my PO box. If you ever do this, please email me once it arrives as I often don't get notified. First up, we've got a box from Thomas all the way in the United States. The shipping box mentions Nike sneakers. Wait, they've literally sent a pair of used sneakers for some reason? These are actually several sizes too small for my feet. And why did you spend $92 to send me these? I can't even wear them. Next, we've got a letter that fell apart, so the post people put it in this bag. This one comes from Edward Tam here in Australia, and they've sent over a phone with a filthy screen protector. Who would use a screen protector to the point that it looks like this, honestly? Anyway, let's take that off and see if it still works. It uses a USB-C connector, so it mustn't be too old. A short time later, it booted up and it hasn't been wiped and it looks like it's password locked. Next, we've got another letter from Edward. This one arrived a lot more intact and it's a thank you card. I hope you had a great day as well. All right, we've got one last card. Um, I don't know, what is this? Anime Jesus? Oh, it's a Christmas card. Well, thank you very much, Zach. I, it may have actually arrived at my PO box on time, but I didn't know it was there until I checked. Here's another package from Thomas all the way in America. It's what looks to be, oh, it's a 12 inch MacBook. Oh, that's pretty neat. The trackpad is cracked, but overall it's not in horrible condition. From what Thomas mentioned, I do believe it may only be good for parts. And hopefully that means the screen is still functional as they're quite hard to get. Another package from Thomas. This one has a power supply, something wrapped in bubble wrap, an American style power cable, and what looks to be a 13 inch MacBook Pro. I also see that there's a handwritten note. Well, thank you very much for this, Thomas. I'll try to use these machines for parts in my future videos. The note also implies that this MacBook doesn't have the logic board installed. So that's what this thing must be, uh, but I have no idea what's wrong with it. Last of all, another one from Thomas in the US of A. Is that a wireless earbud case? 
more wireless earbud cases and a broken headset. These look incredibly well used to say the least. These Beats headphones are, what you could say, quite beat up. In fact, it looks like two out of three of the earbuds cases are empty, with only this white one containing the buds themselves. Well, thanks everyone for sending stuff in. Used shoes and earbuds aren't exactly something you should be sending to be honest, but I do appreciate the effort though and I'll use those MacBooks for parts in future videos. 